Hello friends, uh, welcome to Be Waste Wise. Uh, welcome to yet another panel at Be Waste Wise. And today we're going to discuss lifestyles post-COVID um, with perspectives from Australia and UK. Uh, I, we understand that in a good part of the world, the cities and the countries are still dealing with COVID. But the purpose of this discussion is, uh, is the fact that COVID has really shown how we could all change and adapt our routines when, at the face of a challenge. So the conversation today is going to revolve around whether these changes could uh, essentially be made into long-term behaviors for effective change uh, to support our environment by and large. And uh, before I introduce our panelists, let me quickly tell you about who we are. Be Waste Wise is a nonprofit organization. We address the need for knowledge dissemination and waste management. We provide access to educational resources, direct access to experts, and networking, all of which drives towards building momentum around the global challenge of waste. Currently, we've been organizing two webinars a month on different facets and different aspects of waste management and sustainability. Today, we have Sarah Ottaway, who is a sustainability and social value lead at Suez Recycling and Recovery UK. Uh, Sarah has been a panelist on one of our earlier webinars, which Adam had moderated. You could go to the video panel section and you will be able to see it there. And Sarah is going to talk to Rebecca Prince Ruiz, who's the executive director at Plastic Free Foundation, and Johan, co founder of Geeky Zero. And just a reminder to you all, we did receive your questions with your registrations. However, there is a QA section. Please put in your questions there. Sarah will have a look at the questions and she will ensure that they are posed to the panelists. So over to you, Sarah. Thank you, Swessa. Good morning. And thank you all so much for joining us. This truly international webinar is really a pleasure to be to be chairing today. Um, as uh, as Wes was saying, I'm going to be your chair for the next hour as we discuss how quickly we've been able to change our lifestyles in the wake of COVID and, uh, and why that's not happening when it comes to the climate and the ecological crisis that we find ourselves in and the challenges when it comes to, to waste, obviously, in particular. Um, and we're going to be discussing whether those changes are going to be for the better or for the worse and what opportunities there are for us to come together uh, at a global scale to create a sustainable future. So hopefully can, we can leave with a feeling of optimism after the next uh, 60 minutes. Um, as Sweater said, we are joined by two absolute giants of this sector, and it is really an honour to be sharing the screen with both of them and, and with Sweater as well at the, at the reins, uh, making sure that everything goes smoothly today. So thank you guys so much for joining us. Um, a quick little bit of housekeeping before we get going. Um, obviously, we've got the Q&A box. So as Sweater said, put your questions in there because the majority of today's session is about that discussion and really getting into the detail. Um, there is a chat box as well. So if you've got comments, if you've got thoughts on what we're talking about, add them in so we can feed those into the discussion too. Um, we are recording today's session at the same time and obviously Sweater will tell you more details about how you can catch up if you have any technical issues or if the kids start screaming in the background or anything like that at the same time. Um, so just to give you an idea of the format, I'm going to pass over to both of our wonderful panellists um, individually. They're going to share their perspectives on this topic and a little bit more about who they are and where they come from. And then the majority of our session will be about uh, those questions and uh, getting into those real details. I'm also not going to let you just sit there and, uh, and just listen to what we're saying. We also want you to respond to us as well. So we're going to be scattering some poll questions uh, into the mix for you to respond to us as well. And we're going to put the first one up as a bit of a warm up to get you going. So Swetha, if you do the honours, please. So here we go. Like I say, nice and easy one to, to warm you up. Uh, has COVID-19 encouraged or has it even forced people to adopt more sustainable behaviours from your perspective? Um, do let us know. Simple yes or no. Um, let's see how we get on. We'll just give you a few moments in case uh, you need to put your cuppa down and, uh, and click on the button. So... Um, wonder what the the, uh, the response will be on this where everyone's opinions are it could be quite straightforward it might not be let's let's have a look so, so shall we close that one so it's simple yes or no let's have a look oh interesting response so i'm gonna uh, so we've got a two-thirds yes and a third no so joe um just to bring you in on this one so so we've got a third of people saying that it hasn't encouraged sustainable behaviors what, what what's your take on that 
I'm sure it depends on your own personal situation and where you are in the world. We did some research around behavior change and the impact on sustainable behavior actually during proper deep lockdown in April, May. And the figures uh, were, they were, they were a little bit higher in terms of people feeling that they they made more behavior changes um but there certainly were some people who came back with with you know saying no it hadn't and i think it totally depends on your own personal situation really you know if you're if you're a frontline worker at the nhs or you know in healthcare or some of the the, the professions that carried on life probably didn't change as dramatically as it might have done for other people so i think it just totally depends on your personal situation so i think that 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 is probably a true reflection of the fact that we all live through lockdown in slightly different ways yeah that's a really really interesting point thank you so um just to move on from that so what we'd really like to know as well throughout this the so user chat function for this one is what what, how have you changed your behaviours over the last kind of six to eight months, depending on how COVID has affected where you are? Has your, have you seen, have you taken any uh, more sustainable behaviours? Have you seen how yours have changed in any way, shape or form? Do let us know. We'll have a look at uh, what the popular ones are, or what the most common ones are, more than unusual. It'd be great to know. Uh, share it with us on the chat function. We'll chat about those as we go through today's session. So without further ado, I'm going to pass over to the first of our panellists. I'm going to head, hand back to Joe to uh, give you a bit more insight into the world of Geeky and COVID from the UK perspective. Joe, over to you. Oh, thank you very much. So I'm just going to share a few images. Um, and what I wanted to do was to first talk to you briefly about Geeky so that you know where we're coming from, and also about the impact that we felt that COVID had um, in, in our world. So I'm just uh, sharing, there we go. Um, so Geeky stands for Get Informed, Know Your Impact. And I, we set it up in 2017. I set it up with my husband, James, because we wanted to help people understand the environmental impacts of our day to day life and make changes where, where they where they wanted to to align their concerns about the environment with their behaviours. So clearly, most people in the world want to do the right thing in terms of the environment. But what we find increasingly is actually people don't really know what that looks like. You know, should I uh, stop using plastic straws or should I recycle? Should I buy food wrapped in plastic packaging that has been grown locally or should I buy food that's been air freighted in that isn't wrapped in plastic? There are so many kind of dilemmas. So but inherent in actually the way that we live today, we do all have an environmental footprint. And what I wanted to just show you is a graph that shows what we need to do in terms of behavior change around sustainability. So these are carbon emissions over the last uh, couple of hundred years since the industrial revolution, where we are today globally and where we need to get to by 2030. So this, is, this is the global picture and policy and business change is gonna play a massive part in delivering this, but also we as individuals, and this is where the behavior change point comes in, also have a huge role to play both in terms of what we the choices that we make but also the mandate that we give to business and political leaders so this is what things look like from a personal perspective and all and this is a, i know this is quite a complicated graph to read and you don't need to read it but it shows how you can get from a, a standard uk carbon footprint which is at about nine tons per year down to a positive or net net zero down to here by changing lots of different things in our lives. And I think what COVID's shown us really clearly is that change is possible and can happen actually quite quickly, um, albeit driven by policy. But we see that actually people, when they get the right information in the right tone and at the right time, that they do want to change and it doesn't necessarily need to be driven like by policy as it has been um, through COVID. So that's what we're trying to do with Geeky Zero and it's got two key components. Now Geeky Zero we launched in May in the midst of lockdown and it, I have to say it was a challenging time because I had two young kids at home who we were homeschooling at the same time and uh, they didn't particularly take to lockdown as most kids didn't and um, we thought we can't wait you know we've built we've been building this tool for the last year we've been testing it for the last you know eight months um, 
we've only got 10 years to get on top of this problem. We've just got to get it out there. And we actually, so we did launch in May. And actually what was really heartening is that the focus on sustainability and people's interest in wanting to better understand their environmental impacts didn't feel as if it had reduced as a result of COVID. And in fact, in many ways it had increased. So what we do with Geeky Zero is help people understand what their carbon footprint is across every aspect of their lifestyle. So here we can see your diet, but we cover home, um, transport, goods and services, and then what you can actually do about it. So we've got over 120 steps in there that you can pick from, which you can choose um, across, you know, whether or not it's easy or difficult to do, and also whether or not what the impact is on the planet. And we were inspired to continue with our original plan to, to release during, during lockdown because we did some research in the UK um, talking to adults in, across the social and geographical demographic asking whether or not they become more aware of their carbon footprint and their environmental impact during lockdown and what was really interesting was that over half actually had done and I think there were lots of pictures going around of you know the the, the wonders of nature that was coming back to life as a result of the reduction in pollution and and much quite you know quieter um, environment for, for wildlife to flourish in and you you were seeing these stories all over the world I remember seeing pictures of dolphins swimming in the canals in in Florence and I think people really began to appreciate the natural world in a way that, that maybe they hadn't been able to or had time to before and we also um, found that nearly 50%, 41% had adopted new steps that were more environmentally friendly during lockdown and that actually many of them wanted to continue with them and I think that was really promising as well and quite a lot of these were around uh, plastic because I think that's an area that people have been really strongly focused on because you can see it and you can see the impacts of it so clearly on, on nature and on particularly on the oceans so things like recycling more um, avoiding uh, products with with heavy plastic packaging were, were steps that people um, cited as being things things that they'd started doing to, during lockdown or that they wanted to continue doing so I think what it's shown us is that if we can keep this interest in the preservation of nature alive that, that was awakened during lockdown, then um, hopefully behavior will to continue to change and there is scope to do everything that we need to do to, um, to, to reduce the carbon emissions dramatically in the, in the next 10 years that we need to do. So I'm going to pause there and we, I believe are going to hear from Rebecca next, and then I'm looking forward to discussing the, the findings of the research in more detail as we discuss later on. Fantastic, thank you, Joe. And obviously, if you've got any questions about Joe's um, about Joe's research that you've just been talking about, please do send them through. I've got them piling up here, but I'm going to save them for the question and answer session, and I'm going to throw the floor straight open over to Rebecca to uh, bring in. Uh, the plastic free and Australian perspective on COVID. Rebecca, over to you. Thank you. Um, so 2020 was not the year that many of us were expecting. It was the 10th year of plastic free July. And uh, from a personal level, I think I've learned a lot about about like you know it's already been said that there you know we we saw that people could make change very quickly and importantly for the right reason and so we did actually have a conversation in it was the end of march like should we go ahead obviously human health was paramount um and people were under so many different pressures from from the health issue to you know, the challenges of living in lockdown with families and, and um, job losses and financial pressures. And we work very closely with a behavioural scientist. So we got together in May and I called him up and just said, Colin, you know, what should we do? Should we not do plastic? Should we cancel Plastic Free July? Should we um, make it Plastic Free September? And at that stage, 
you know, he commented on like the interesting trend that was emerging of people baking more, making things from scratch um, here in Australia. And I know in other parts of the world, there was shortages of things like flour or running out of seedlings. People started to plant stuff in the garden and, you know, how he explained it to me is like in this time where so many things are out of our control, actually taking back control and doing something positive was really important to people. And so the feedback that we started to get as we started to talk to people and businesses and local governments and corporates around the world, you know, many of whom were in lockdown or working from home, the feedback that we really got from people was actually one of the positives of this is it gives us time to start to look at some of our habits and choices and behaviours to try new things, um, to spend that time figuring out how I sort my recycling properly or how I might make something from scratch to reduce the, my packaging, etc., um, or try some alternative products in the bathroom. Or, um, there were just so many things that people wanted to do and and make a difference so um we've just um in the process of reporting on the impacts of plastic free july 2020 and this is a campaign that from I'm not sure how many of the people listening this afternoon or this morning depending where you are in the world um have heard of plastic free july or participated in it before but it's a it's a campaign to encourage people and help and support people to reduce and refuse single use plastics. And it's not about swapping out single use plastics for single use other materials. It's really about waste avoidance. And it's a campaign which has grown from a personal challenge to a global campaign. And it's about not just a few people or the converted doing everything. It's not about being able to fit your year's worth of landfill waste in a mason jar. Um, I'm certainly, it's great that people can do that. I'm certainly not, not one of those myself yet, but this is about getting a lot of people making small changes at the same time. And what our research has shown is that when, when that happens and lots of people make small changes and just reduce their waste by 5%, which is, which is what we have found that people participating in Plastic Free July does, then that starts to add up to a really big impact. And I think kind of, you know, that's what we've seen in COVID as well. When we all do the right thing, it doesn't take much to shift and, and get a big impact. And I think that, you know, it's easy to think of well, what difference can one person make, but individual behaviour change at that at, at, at scale leads to a cumulative impact. And then, you know, when we as a cult, when we start to change culture and we get these 5% shifts, you know, when we all start to pick off those things in that graph that Joe was showing, then we start to change our culture. We put pressure on business and government, and that then leads to that then leads to system change. And so, I'm just gonna um, just gonna share with you if I can figure out my right screen here. Um, some of our results from Plastic Free July 2021. I can't immediately see the right screen. Um, might just have to yeah, just go into this. Um, so, um, so I've got my own image over the top of it. Okay, so the kind of the kind of quantum and the numbers that we're talking about when. Um, so this campaign, back when we, I started it in 2011, there were 40 of us participating and it's really a grassroots campaign. We don't have a media budget, it's grown through word of mouth. And our estimates are that this year, 326 million people around the world took part. 
and together avoided 940 million kilos. You can, my maths isn't good enough to just convert that into pounds off the top of my head, but we're starting to get massive uh, waste avoidance happening. And what happens, we also measure um, through our general population surveys, policy, uh, people's support for policy change. This is going beyond the individual behaviour change to um, asking questions about, you know, should uh, producers and manufacturers take responsibility for their packaging? Should um, producers be required to use recycled content? And it was really surprising. So we had 92% of the general public saying they supported those actions. And that was up from 80% last year. So despite the challenges and despite uh, through our research, 66% of people said it was more of a challenge this year to reduce their plastic waste, but they still managed, they couldn't do everything. They maybe couldn't, you know, use their reusable shopping bag or uh, take a reusable coffee cup, but there were still other things that, um, people could do and this is just a, a lovely spread of images from our uh, annual impact statement showing plastic free July around the globe and whether it's an elephant park in Laos that shifted to reusable water bottles and use things like bamboo leaves for uh, not bamboo leaves um, banana leaves for their plates to uh, aged care homes in New Zealand that went to um, stopping using single serve plastic packaging to sports centres in Australia, putting in water bottle refills when they reopened to hotels switching from liquid soap to bar soap to people growing their own food. There's just so many things that people can do and I think that the more at a global level we start to have conversations and share, we all know the problem, as Joe earlier said, we know what the problems are, we know the challenges that are ahead of us, we've got a lot of work to do and the more we focus on solutions and support each other, um, the more of an impact that we're going to have. So that's the, a bit of the Plastic Free July um, story. And I'm too looking forward to the discussion and hearing what people's questions are and, and how we can do better. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Rebecca. That was really interesting. Um, so we've had a few questions come in. So Joe, I'm going to come straight over to you just uh, as immediate responses to your guys, um, to your guys' presentations and your your chat so far. Um, was uh, what's the biggest change that you saw through the research in terms of the the behaviours that people reported that they had individually changed? And it does that match up to what you're seeing through the changes made through Geeky Zero? Oh, well, that's interesting. So the biggest change was recycling more about a third of people said that they were recycling more. Um, at the same level was using bags for life um, and also trying to conserve electricity. So turning off the lights, you know, turning off your um, appliances. And then they were followed by things like uh, taking walks locally rather than um, driving for exercise, uh, which may have been more, you know, that was definitely more of a product of the rules as to what you had to do. But interestingly, people I think then discovered the wonders of their local area that maybe they hadn't always been aware of before. So that was, um, they were the most popular ones. Food waste was also a popular one. And what was also interesting is that three quarters of people said that they intended to, to continue with these changes that they'd made in the long term. Now, how that's playing out in Geeky Zero, what's really interesting is that people, because we're all different, because we all have a di our, our carbon footprint and our broader environmental impact is different, both in terms of uh, you know, what we eat and how we dispose of our food and all that kind of thing, um, but also um, you know, do we travel a lot? Do we live in a city in a well-insulated flat or do we live in the countryside, which certainly in you know, countries with lots of old build, uh, buildings, they can be drafty and very badly insulated. Um, 
and th th so th the changes that people need to make to get the biggest impact de totally depends on your own personal circumstances. So I would say that what the, the biggest trends that we're seeing in Geeky Zero is that people tend to start with the smaller, easier steps, not that surprising. But then once they feel good about the fact that they made some initial changes, that can then give you the confidence and the, and the inclination to actually take on something a bit more challenging. So, you know, a really, a really popular one, which, which is one that people always say, oh, yeah, I hadn't thought of that, which I have to say I hadn't really thought of probably before, is put lids on your saucepan whenever you're cooking, because it just saves a bit of energy, saves a little bit on your bills, but it also just gets you into the mindset of thinking about these resources are not just sort of there in you know the never ending keep on coming forever and ever it just makes you value a little bit more everything that we have access to um so a lot of the smaller steps are actually about beginning to help people have a little bit of a mindset change um and actually uh some of the other smaller popular ones are things like changing from uh shampoo uh in a bottle to shampoo bars um somebody i was talking to the other day had had a <laughs> had a heated discussion with somebody in the supermarket and one of the ladies who was stacking the shelves why haven't you got bars of shampoo she said well we just don't stock them and he was like well why not you know everybody wants them now and I think that that kind of conversation is what will begin to to you know push companies to provide the kind of goods and services that, that people want so that was a long answer sorry but an interesting one so don't don't apologize for that at all no no no. that was fascinating and a quick question for Rebecca as well obviously plastic free movement is now you know globally recognized we've got hundreds of millions of people involved what's the what's the long what's the next step for the foundation what where, what are your ambitions for uh, for the future um so our our big picture vision is is not for a world without plastic we do acknowledge that there's a role for plastic, but it's a world without plastic waste. So we don't want to see plastic ending up in our environment. We don't want to see it ending up in our landfills. And I think that, you know, I think that we've um, we've had a lot of wins over the last 10 years. You know, 10 years ago, people weren't talking about single use plastic or disposable plastics. And now it is very much in our you know, a topic of conversation. We've seen plastic bag bans coming in. We've seen, you know, bottle refund schemes. Um, but the, you know, despite everything, you know, the recycling, we've only managed to recycle 9% of all of the plastic that's ever been produced. And recycling is really important. But I think at the one of our fundamental problems is that it is generally cheaper and easier for producers and manufacturers to use um, virgin plastics than it is to use recycled content. So I think, you know, some of the thing. I think food packaging is going to be the very big challenge. And I think that our, our governments need to set those frameworks, whether it's through requiring minimum mandated um, amounts of recycled content or, uh, you know, attacks on vir virgin plastic. But we have to do something to this, you know, when, we, when you look at the figures of plastic production set to quadruple by 2050 versus this recycling rate that's pretty much stagnant at that 9% globally, this, this gap, which is the plastic waste, is just ever increasing and we have to do something fundamentally to change the, the market and the economy where, where it's linear, where it's take, make, throw, and I think, and move towards that circular economy, which goes beyond just recycling and waste to looking at product design, looking at, looking at, looking at communities as well and how we can start to value the resources um, and not consume in the same way that we are now, but that as we make these kinds of transitions, it's 
it is that there are those social and community benefits as well shifting from this you know from this take make throw to a circular economy which is a service economy and we have all those labor benefits as well yeah and that's and that's a key part of this whole debate isn't it is that we're not just looking at one part of the sustainability agenda it's the whole the it's the social the economic and it's the environmental isn't it all as as one piece that's very true thanks rebecca so uh, you guys have been sharing with us your uh, the changes that you've been making so it's been fascinating to see what you've been putting up on the chat so thank you for that so you know we're seeing you know you're, you're flying less you're not eating out as much i guess some of that obviously is is forced but spending less in general what else haven't been saying uh, uh, working from home getting out and exercising every day I've got to admit I've been doing that I go for a walk every morning as well it's wonderful I'm not just running for a train or jumping in a in a car um it's it's great and I think there's well uh, eating less meat less food waste I know that's something here in the UK it's been uh, reported quite a bit on is is that reduction in food waste because we're spending more time thinking about what we're eating preparing and making sure we've got the right stuff in the right place also helps if you can't buy certain things in the supermarket I suppose that makes us think a little bit differently as well and um, so yes yeah, some really great examples in there so thank you guys so much for sharing please do keep bringing them in that takes us really nicely into our second poll question which is how can we uh, increase the possibility of keeping these positive behaviors once we're back to normal so we've got four options for you um, and i apologize if you can hear it but i've got a really loud helicopter or something going over my house um so apologies if the, the microphone's picking that up so but we've got four different options so is it about education and awareness is it about producer responsibility? And as you know, Rebecca was saying about those incentives around recycled content or, uh, or virgin material taxes, do we need to really push them to think about it? Is it about government policy? Is it about them bringing in those measures? Is it about them legislating for what we, what we expect and how we expect um, both companies and consumers to respond? And is it, is it just direct fin financial prompts? Is it about bringing in tax measures? Is it about um, other kind of nudges that are more financially based for people to think more about the true cost of what they're buying. Now, to make this really, uh, you know, a bit more of a head scratcher, you can only select one of these because I, I don't know about uh, the rest of the panelists, but I would probably pick a mixture of all four. So uh, we've thought let's make it a little bit more difficult for you guys. So um, we'll give you just a moment to have a think on that one and uh, we'll bring them up. Here we go. So uh, an interesting mix. So I'm going to come over to Rebecca for your thoughts on those panels so obviously education and awareness is the big one followed closely by government policy what do you make of that Rebecca? I think they're all right you know there's no one single silver bullet um I've just lost those results there um to to solving this problem and I think it's going to take action um at, at all those levels and um and as I said before, I think, you know, I think one can lead to the to the other as well. So that, you know, that that, you know, I don't think that we would, you know, in my state, we have just um, at the on the 1st of October, my state of Western Australia, we just introduced a container deposit scheme. So where you get take back, you pay a 10 cent deposit on beverage containers and then you take them back and get your 10 cent, cent refund and that that's paid that 10 cents and the cost of running the scheme is paid for by the beverage companies and you know we would not have that scheme that scheme has taken 10 years or more of campaigning from individuals from community groups from local governments from people running events and you know trialing it to see if it worked you know we ran one back in 2012 and got a grant of $500 worth of 10 cent coins from the local bank because everyone said oh no no one will do that anymore for 10 cents and um So I think that, you know, we absolutely need that policy change. We need governments to put in place the legislation. So it's a level playing field for businesses because, you know, it's more costly. Um, I've got a, re a bag, shopping bag made from recycled plastic water bottles and that retails for, you know, sells for four times the price of if it was made from virgin plastic. So we need 
we need all of those to happen. And I think the biggest changes we've seen over the last 10 years have been in that through the education and the awareness raising the David Attenborough effect, the individual behaviour change. And I think that you know, in the next 10 years, we've got to see the action from governments and businesses. So, you know, we can't have, we've, we've got to have the seesaw imbalance here. Absolutely. And Joe, anything you want to add to Rebecca's comments on that one? Yeah, I just totally agree. I think we've got to the stage because we've so fantastically successfully ignored all the set, all the messages that nature sent us for the last 30, 40 years you know, particularly around carbon emissions, but also around plastic and uh, the impacts of humanity on um, on nature and, and animals. The warning signs have been there for a long time and we've merrily ignored them. And as a result, we have much less time to actually make the changes that we have to make before they become totally irreversible. And I think as a result of that, um, we need really strong policy change, we need business transformation, and we need us as individuals to um, take, uh, take pleasure and ownership in, in working towards protecting the environment in the broadest possible sense, because if we don't, it won't be as it is now for that much longer, and, and uh, we won't be able to do anything about it then. So I think, yeah, we've got to do everything from every angle really now, and we can do it. I mean, we do know how to do it, which is the great thing. We, we know what all the answers are. We just have to prioritise them. Thanks, Joe. And I, th I think the, let's uh, let's go on to one of the one of the questions from the audience now. So uh, you've been sending them in, obviously pre pre today's session and throughout the conversation we've been having already. So thank you so much for that. I think one that's come up probably more than any others is um, a question around around wealth and that a lot of these behaviors are often associated with a financial cost. So whether that's, you know, buying a, a reusable cup or buying different alternatives such as shampoo bars, which can be uh, on the face of it more expensive. So are we, is there, is there an issue when it comes to the financial side of, um, of sustainable behaviors? You know, and how do we bring everybody along with us regardless of their financial position uh, in, in life. So, so Joe, how, how would you respond to that sort of question? Yeah, I think there are two key points to that. Firstly, generally, the richer you are, the bigger your carbon footprint and the bigger your environmental footprint. There was some fascinating research that came out recently from Oxfam that showed that something like the top 1% in terms of wealth in the globe were responsible for a, a vast proportion of carbon emissions globally. You know, some but bearing in mind that the UK average footprint is nine tonnes, we are well above the global average, which is five tonnes, because we're a wealthy nation here. And as a result, people have bigger carbon footprints. Um, some uber wealthy people have a footprint of about 350 tonnes. So the wealthy are generally the ones who have the biggest changes to make and can afford to make them. So that, that you know, that's definitely a point that is important to remember. So there are already quite a significant people in the world, number of people in the world who are living a net zero lifestyle by virtue of the fact that they tend to live in, in less wealthy countries. Um, in terms of, is it more expensive? We've actually got, so we've got about 120 steps in Geeky Zero, about a third of them actually save you money. Um, and I think that's one of the challenges around the sustainability debate that there's an assumption that it will cost you more and it's definitely true on a product by product basis a more sustainable product may well be more expensive because it has priced in to an extent its impact on the environment um, and as a result you're paying more for it but if you live a more sustainable life in the whole so you you know you use less aircraft, um, you eat less red meat, which can be very expensive, um, you know, you travel less. Um, actually, not only would you reduce your carbon footprint and your broader environmental impact, but you would also save money. So I think that while there are certain elements of a more sustainable life, like, you know, eating organic food, for example, which tends to be more, more expensive than um, 
regular food, actually a lot of the changes that you, that you can make do save money. And uh, Rebecca, anything to add to that one? Thank you, Joe. Yeah, just um, absolutely agree with, you know, what Joe has said. I think just two other things come to mind. For me, one of the biggest things is food waste. You know, the global average of food waste is 30% of all the food that is grown that is wasted. I know in Australia and in the US, that figure is closer to 40%, and a lot of that happens in the home. So... Um, and again, you know, I haven't seen any research on this, but I suspect the, the wealthier that, that we are, um, you know, the more that we probably do waste. And I think that that's something that we really focused on during COVID and Plastic Free July this year is, is how, to, how to waste less food because then we're also wasting less packaging, but also less money as, as well. So... Um, and I guess the second thing is I think that I think that we also need to look at how we're positioning sustainability, how that what that messaging is. Um, I think that you know a lot of it is being being promoted from a kind of a marketing perspective. It's about selling stuff. And to me, it's not about having the latest water bottle in the latest colours or getting a new one every season. It's like you use what you have. Um, but I think that it, as a movement, we're also kind of guilty about um, promoting it as a lifestyle and rather than sharing um, stories and images of normal people doing the right thing. So I know when I worked on the plastic bag ban here in Western Australia, it was, you know, here's a photo of a, a uni student who's buying one or two things and they're, they're juggling, they're, you know, they're not using any bag. Here's someone, a mum that's been to a gym and she's got, you know, some bread sticking out of her backpack, you know. It's not about necessarily going out and buying an organic cotton bag. It's using that cardboard box. It's using the bag that you already have at home in the back of your car, uh, in the back of your cupboard or in the car boot. It's, it's not always about buying our way out of this problem. And I think the way that we message that and the fact that, you know, Yes, some of these options, you know, putting a solar panels on your roof might be more expensive, but, you know, if you switch, I know when I switched to reusable menstrual products, it was to reduce the waste, but I can't believe how much money that I've saved for a small initial investment. I've saved, you know, hundreds of times, that hundreds and hundreds of times over over the last five years. So we need to look... Uh, at the bigger picture here, but we also need to look at the way that we're sharing these messages as well. Agree completely with you, Rebecca. I think there's uh, it's it's about that prioritisation and that normalisation of of these things. This is about like you know, like you say, like the you know, reusable menstrual menstrual products. They should become the norm rather than you know the uh, disposable options. You know, that's that's the ideal that we're we're working towards, aren't we? Um, Completely agree with you. Okay, so I'm going to whiz over to another question from our panel. So, um, uh, Dominique's up in Gateshead in the north of the UK, and she's saying that um, there are plenty of uh, examples out there of during Corona that companies have come back from some of the promises that are making to make positive change. And she cites both Costa and Starbucks, obviously massive coffee brands who stopped using their, stopped refilling cups, particularly in the UK. I'm, I'm assuming that they have done in other, other territories as well. Um, and it's obviously frustrating that they've used that to scale back and they haven't particularly come in back in particularly quickly. What, what can we do about this? How do we challenge those behaviors and that, um, and that reactive uh, stance to go back to disposable in, in these sorts of times of crisis. Um, uh, Rebecca, what, what, do you, what do you make of that? So I think that we have been very good, well, largely very good at listening to the science on this virus, on the precautions that we need to take. And I think that I think it's a difficult situation at the moment 
because obviously this human health concern is at the top of the agenda and rightly so. But I think we need to be really careful and listen to the science on the use of reusables the act and the actual health risks associated with, um, with um, using reusables. And I think, you know, can, you know I think that some of these um, decisions and responses are not rational and they're not following the science. So this is a, it's a respiratory virus. It's not gastrointestinal. The best things that we can be doing are the social distancing, the washing our hands, the, the wearing of masks. Um, you know, to be honest, the, the biggest risk is actually, you know, from that cup is from, is not, if you're going to get it from drinking a coffee out of that, your reusable cup it's actually being in that cafe in the first place um so i think that that the more that we um the more that we get you know ask that question directly of scientists and you know get that health advice and start to communicate though so that that research um um the the better that we're going to start to take some of the heat of the emotion out of these kinds of these discussions. And, you know, at the end of the day, you know, perhaps for business, for some businesses that they've got so much on their plate to deal with in terms of their closures and staffing, et cetera, that it's, you know, they've, they've used the health concern as just an excuse and we just might not be able to win all of those kind of arguments in the short term. But I've certainly found, you know, the more we can have those conversations to say, you know, here is our state or federal, you know, health department's advice, here's what the scientists are saying about these issues, um, the, 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 the more like, likely you are to get, get that message heard. Thanks, Rebecca. That makes, makes a lot of sense. Um, question for you, Joe. So we haven't talked a lot about local authorities necessarily at the moment or councils or collection authorities, those responsible for um, collecting, recycling and waste as, you know, obviously there's different setups at different places uh, across the globe. Um, but when, particularly when we're looking at the Western world and the sort of setups that we have, um, how can we bring them into this problem? What's their responsibility in all of this? So, in, in terms of um, local active uh, uh, local authority actions in in the UK, a surprising number have actually already declared a climate emergency. I think it's about sixty percent, which is really amazing when you think about it. And I think that that's often due to local uh, you know local people just asking for it, pushing for it, which is great. Um, I think sometimes the challenge then for local authorities is. You know what does that actually look like what do you actually do okay we've acknowledged that there's a, a big problem here um what are we going to do about it and and how how can we pay for it which clearly is is a challenge at the moment and, and has been in the uk for some time that council budgets have been significantly reduced so there's um i think there are there are for councils there are a number of different components in that there's their own operations in the areas that they're responsible for like their own buildings but also if they're doing if they're uh, responsible for the waste collection um, that's a key part but also then actually engaging with people locally and encouraging them to want to make changes that are going to be supportive of the broader local policies and those are two quite big and quite different tasks for local councils to do. I think another thing that we hear repeatedly from the general public who, who use, um, use up both our, all, our, all of our tools is that they want, they want clarity and particularly around recycling, which is a really tricky one, depending on where you live in the UK, you know, is this Tetra Pak recyclable? you know, that, that often on the label, it's it's challenging to know whether it is really. And there's um, not always the clearest information in terms of what's on the packaging. And then in terms of what your local council will actually do for you as, as an individual varies massively depending on where you live in the country. And 
you know, you can look it up online if you've got the time, etc. But many people don't. And, and I'm sure as a result, a lot of stuff just ends up going to landfill because people aren't sure whether or not they can recycle it. So I think I think um, councils being, uh, you know, being supported in their declaration of a climate emergency and what they can actually do about it, it's really important. And also clarity to the general public in terms of what, what kind of support the council's offering them is really important. Great. And, and Rebecca, coming over to you, from, uh, for places where you know, collections are not quite as formalised or the facilities are just not as available um, to the local population, what, what could governments um, to do to legislate, to ban, to encourage, to, to change the way the market responds and, and influence consumption, particularly around, obviously, plastics, um, as obviously that's your, uh, you know, obviously your, your specialism. <laughs> Rebecca, you're on mute. Sorry, do you specifically mean like policy at that, you know, local level? Yeah, so where, where, the, where the biggest drivers could be, obviously policy could be one of them, but if a, if a local government hasn't got that formal system to, to influence both the market and, and the population, what, what other measures could they, could they look at doing? I mean, I think one of the things, you know, and it, and it depends on the jurisdiction, but, you know, looking at what they have control over. So I know that a lot of, um, a lot of jurisdictions where they have the planning commission, say for example, events, for example, have been able to develop, um, to, to develop um, criteria for, you know, who can be, the, the, the types of food service um, businesses that are attending those events. So the kinds of packaging they're using or not using the types of um, um, giveaways or materials that are, that are there. And I think that looking to, looking for where they have agency and they can make change um, such as, um, such as things like events that they give planning permission for, such as, you know, balloon re releases is a kind of a great one that, that, that I've seen a number of jurisdictions take control, um, take control um, of and, and ban because they're the, they're, they're the agencies that are, that are giving those planning permits out. So, um, and, and, and it can, range from anything from that to um, I was talking to one jurisdiction who um, it was actually their people responsible for their parks and their maintenance and their mowing program realized if they switched around their schedule for their cleanups and did the cleanups before they did a mowing then they were actually stopping this what was happening before was that um, because they weren't doing the clean up first, they, when they were mowing, they were just creating these gazillion pieces of microplastic because they were going over um, um, bits of packaging. Whereas once they did their clean ups first and then did their, their gardening program, um, it resulted in much less of a problem or it might be requiring um, infrastructure in stormwater drainage systems that are litter traps so a development might be um, a developer might be required to put in that infrastructure and maintain it so it's really around looking at what they have control and influence over um, as well as I think they've really led the way in supporting and engaging communities in making sustainable behavior change as well Fantastic. Plen plenty for them to, to still be doing, even if they haven't got those formal systems in place. Fantastic. OK, I am very conscious that we are vastly running out of time. and I'm sure we could carry on talking about this all day because there is so much to cover. Um, so can we jump to poll four? Would that be OK? Wonderful. So we're going to put one last poll up and uh, Joe and Rebecca can come to you for your kind of final thoughts and your responses to this at the same time. So where are the biggest opportunities for us to collaborate at a global scale? to create a sustainable future. Um, you know, the collaboration on so many ways is happening. We can see the influence of um, the Plastic Free Foundation. It's becoming a global movement as are many others. What more could we do? So, and again, you can only pick one 
So uh, you can't pick them all, you can only pick one. And uh, Joe and Rebecca, I'm gonna ask you for your number ones on this as well. So creating international producer responsibility, pushing for government action, encouraging that consumer led action. So building on that fantastic um, work of the plastic free movement, developing circular business models. There's plenty others and I'm sure we could add to that list for at least another hour, um, but pick, pick one. And I'm gonna ask for your responses really quickly. I'm gonna give you five, four, three, two, one and then we're going to see the results here we go oh a real mixture okay um so a real even mix between the first three and uh, secular business models creeping along in the background so um as we have five minutes like i say uh joe rebecca i'm gonna come to you for your you're one of those that you would pick if you had to select one and your final thoughts that you're going to take away from today's session so joe i'll come to you first What's your, what would be the one of those that you would pick? What's the biggest opportunity, do you think, for us? You're on mute as well. I think the biggest, if you'd asked me five years ago, I would have definitely said push for government action. You know, that's where the power sits. But I think I would now say consumer action because there's there's a real disconnect between what the government governments internationally have shown they can do so far and what people, want governments to do and we're seeing this with the schools movements and movements like plastic free july and lots of other really strong movements where people want uh, preservation of the environment which isn't translating into policy um, so if that 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 those voices can be uh, broader and really become mainstream across you know every country that that across the globe then it will be much, much harder for policymakers not to implement the legislation that we really need. Um, so I think that the, start, the starting point now is really galvanizing um, mainstream support across the world for, for the changes that we need to see to give governments the mandate that, that, that they need to, to drive the policies through. Fab. And just quickly, Rebecca, what would be your, one of those that you would pick if you had to pick one? You're on mute, I dare. It's so easy done, I do it all the time. <laughs> Sorry, I ha had to just go back and actually see the list <laughs> list there myself. I'm working off a very small screen. Um, I think for me, it's definitely that creating international producer responsibility. You know, we're producing more, more material and it is absolutely the time to put the responsibility for the products that are created um, back, you know, the community's been paying for them, the local government's been paying the cost of it, the environment's been paying the cost of it. Um, we absolutely need to put that responsibility back on the manufacturers and producers of those products. Very true, fantastic. Um, Thank you so much. I'm going to ask you two for your one sentence to, to finish and sum up for today. Before I do, I was going to say to those of you who've sent in questions that we haven't covered, uh, I'm, I'm ever so sorry. They were fantastic questions. They just didn't make it to the top of the pile. Um, thank you for the continued chat as well. It's been great to see the other things that you've been up to. Naked food products, so they've been a, 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 a reoccurring theme in the more recent chat. So thank you for those two. Um, I'm going to come back to Joe and Rebecca for your final final sentence to wrap up and sum up what we've taken away from today. Um, Rebecca, what, what would be your? Um, I think mine would be focus on what you can do, not what you can't, and connect with other people in your community and this extended global community. We now know it's really easy to talk to and together make a difference, don't try and do it alone. Fantastic, and, and Jo? I totally agree with that. And I'd just say, don't underestimate the power of your voice and your actions to inspire other people. Sometimes it can feel like, you know, what difference can I make? But actually collectively, we can all make a really big difference. And don't be shy to share your views with your, your peers, because even if they don't agree initially, they often come around after a few gentle nudges. 
I think I'd add on to that as well. You'd be surprised what people are already doing. So I know that's something I've certainly started to do over lockdown is share things. And people go, actually, I'm doing that already. Not necessarily the people you would necessarily tag with with those either. So yeah, it's definitely a good conversation starter as well to start that going. Brilliant. Thank you both so much. Uh, Thank you everyone for listening. I'm going to pass back to to Sweater to wrap up for today. Over to you. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Joe. And thank you, Rebecca. Uh, I really thought the conversation ended in such a good note, which uh, fundamentally pushes people to build a community, which is pretty much what Joe and Rebecca and Sarah had to say uh, at the end of the conversation. Thanks a lot for your time. It was a very interesting uh, conversation because, uh, like I did mention in the beginning, it's not that we've seen the end of COVID, but we are actually seeing that we can all make changes. And a lot of people have been sharing that they have been making changes as well. So uh, just a reminder to the audience that we have two more webinars happening next week. Please head to our website and you can sign up there. And also do sign up to our newsletter to be updated about uh, any future webinars that we we will organize and Sarah is going to moderate a few more uh, panels on Be Waste Wise. So thanks a lot and uh, good evening, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you're at. Bye-bye.